So moving along here, we, uh, I, I, you know, I haven't been counting the exact number, but I think we might have said the word content perhaps uh, maybe like 100 times. And, um, and uh, that's, you know, that's because it's the vessel that we use to actually communicate with our customers and interact with them. And you know, if you, if you want to get found, you can't just have content. You have to have great content. And in order to, in order to make great content, we think it's really important to, to have a, a story behind your content. It needs to have a story. It needs to have a message. It needs to, be, it needs to evoke emotion. And whether it's 140 characters, or whether it's three pages, or whether it's a video, it needs to tell a story. We need to, help, we need to figure out how to, how, to how to make our brand, whatever we're doing, actually tell a story. So I am, uh, I'm super excited that we've got um, an incredible storyteller um, here to, uh, to, to share his story with you guys. And um, I'm going to introduce uh, James to, to the stage. James Lucene has been called one of the greatest storytellers of his generation by the New York Times. He wrote the short film Trevor, which won the 1995 Academy Award for Best Live Action Short and inspired the founding of the Trevor Project, the only nationwide 24-hour suicide prevention and crisis intervention lifeline for LGBT and questioning youth. James is an accomplished actor, having performed on and off Broadway, as well as on television. Please welcome James Lucene. Um, thank you so much. Um, storyteller makes me sound like somebody that goes to grammar schools and sits around uh, telling kids stories. But um, actually, I've worked in many fields, including TV and film and publishing books. And I've always been really interested in what are the basic building blocks of story that are universal and that every person, regardless of their background or their ethnicity or their country, can understand. So. Um, I don't need to tell you that stories have been around since uh, as long as human beings have been on the planet. Um, we're a, a species that is uh, particularly, there we go, there we are. Um, we're a species that is really equipped to tell stories. We're unique in the whole animal kingdom. We're the only species that has this capability. And in fact, our brains are really there, there's gear, they're actually made to tell stories. Um, a story has the ability to fire up different lobes of your brain, something like a, um, a, a system of thinking that only is engaged and only fired up when you're thinking about the human being and you're trying to figure people out. So a story has that unique ability. Um, you know, we've been at it ever since the cave dwellers first decided to advertise their fascination with local bison and horses. Um, and it's sort of built into our DNA. It's something you're all actually experts at. Uh, you begin to put together the basic building blocks of story from the moment that you are out of the womb. By six months, you've already begun to figure it out. You're putting the pieces together. By two, three years old, you know how to hear a story. You know how to tell a story and you actually even know how to change a story, and by that I mean lie. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, as, as you can see here, this is a quote from the Arabian Nights. Uh, Stories are the common currency of humanity. And just to use this metaphor a little bit, we all use stories in every facet of our lives, um, in our personal lives, in our private, you know, lives, in our public lives, in our work life. We all are telling stories all the time. But the difference is that some people, probably about 10% of those people, actually know how to make a story. And to stretch the metaphor uh, to currency, it's sort of like we all use money. Uh, we use money to stay alive. We're all functioning all the time, passing money. But not everybody knows how to make money. So my job today is to just to sort of shed a little bit of light on just one of the facets of how to make better stories and how to make them work better for you and hopefully to have those stories make money um, because that's part of the deal. Um, so I just want to start a little bit uh, by telling you briefly about how I came to understand the power of story. And it was really kind of an accident for me how I came to understand this. Um, Back in the 20th century, I was, 
I'm an actor, a writer, I create things. And I was listening to the radio, NPR, one morning, and I happened to hear a, uh, a, a news report about teen suicide. And I was really completely shocked by the statistics. Uh, uh, suicide among the age group of 13 to 24 is the second leading cause of death in this country. And that was really shocking in and of itself. But then they went on to just sort of casually mention the fact that of those numbers, uh, about 33 to 34% that they knew of were attributable to homosexuality. And this seemed like an enormous shock to me. I had never heard of this. And uh, this was in the early 90s. And I was myself living in New York as an, uh, an artist and living through what was basically a plague. Uh, the AIDS epidemic was sweeping through the city. Um, it was killing hundreds, thousands of people, many of them my friends and colleagues. So I saw this one generation of people suddenly you know, just dying while the whole world stood by and basically did nothing. And then I saw this other generation of young people who were coming up and actually killing themselves. And it just made me crazy. And I thought, wait a minute, we have to, I have to do something about this. Like, I have to figure something out. And I had, I had no power. But I only had the power of storytelling. That's all I had. That's all I've ever really had. So I sat down and I began to write a story about a 13-year-old boy named Trevor who begins to understand through a series of diary entries that he's different from his family and his friend. And he is eventually you know, blessed by the knowledge that he's gay. And it doesn't go so well. He gets sort of ostracized by his friends, his family is disapproving, and he realizes that it would be better for him if he were not around. Now, in the story, it's actually very humorous and it's very touching, and he doesn't go through with uh, the suicide and decides to live another day. But what happened was that I began to perform this show around New York in little theaters downtown. And one day, uh, two producers from LA, Peggy Reisky and Randy Stone, came to see the performance and asked me afterwards if I would adapt the story to a short film, a screenplay for a short film, and, which I did. We raised the money, we made the film, and incredibly, the film won an Academy Award in 1994, which was extraordinarily exciting. Never too late for congratulations. <laughs> um, you know, that was 20 years ago. And what happened was a year and a half uh, later, uh, we made arrangements with HBO to broadcast the film to, in case, you know, we just thought it was a wonderful thing to do to put out there in the world, it was time. The world was really ready for this story, to start thinking about young gay and lesbian people. And so we made arrangements with them. We had Ellen DeGeneres do an amazing wraparound presentation. And Peggy and Randy and I thought, well, wait a minute, this is going into the homes of thousands of people out there. And there are bound to be young people out there who can relate to the character of Trevor and maybe have nowhere to turn. So we thought, OK, we'll put the number of a suicide prevention lifeline for gay and lesbian teenagers at the end of the film. There was none. Uh, we did a lot of research, and we found that there was no number, so Peggy and Randy and I created the Trevor Project, which became the first national 24-hour suicide prevention and crisis intervention lifeline specifically for LGBT and questioning youth. Thank you. Still happening. Um, you know, so since then, um, that's, for, that's a still from the film, which I happen to love. That's him and his best friend, Pinky, uh, who was the captain of the baseball team. Um, so, you know, Trevor became a, a kind of a lighthouse for generations of kids coming up who had no place to turn. It actually changed the conversation in the, in the, the United States and consequently the world about what it meant to be a young, gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, or questioning teen. Uh, since then, we've had to move with the times. We've had to adjust our message to meet young people where they are. And so in the past few years, we uh, created uh, Trevor Chat, which is sort of like a warm line. 
and Trevor Text and Trevor Space, which is a, a Facebook for young LGBT kids, offering peer-to-peer -peer support to one another. And there are hundreds of thousands of members on Secure Site. It's an incredible revolution that has happened very quietly and over the past 20 years, changing the conversation of not only what it means to be homosexual for uh, a young person, but also what it means to grow up into that world. As each generation comes up, we have to keep refitting our message and our way of reaching that generation to fit where they're at. So, you know, that's m my story of how I under began to understand how amazing a story can, uh, can be in the world, and, and really as a demonstration of, uh, not only because I'm so proud of the Trevor Project and the work they do 24-7, saving young lives, but also because it really just shows you how a, a story can be ongoing. So, um, th there's a bunch of people <laughs> being happily themselves. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, one of the things that's, uh, you know, what is a story? Uh, I know that most of you are not here to change the world. I know that uh, many of you probably don't even think of yourselves as storytellers. But what I want to do is to be able to introduce you to just one of the basic building blocks of story that may actually help you in the work that you're doing uh, to change the world. Uh, it's, you know, I just have to say that being here at a conference like this is so exciting. It's, for me, it's like actually visiting the future. Uh, you're amazing what you're doing trying to figure out this new world that we're living in, and it's a really exciting time for you. Um, you don't need me to tell you all the things that people have said before about this new world of consumer-driven product and services. It's, it's incredible. But I, I think you, know, you also know that really what consumers are looking for are more um, accountability and transparency. And they're looking for companies that actually share their values, especially millennials that are reaching out to these companies that, that they feel are like them. And that puts the, the onus on your companies and to be able to not only create great services and products, but to, become, uh, to come up with a way in which you can deliver your values to those people so that it's clear what your company represents. And this is a huge shift. It's no longer about the guy who's got the bigger budget or the more muscle to convince you that they have the better product. You actually have to move them from one value to another. So this brings me to what is a story? I mean, beyond just a series of events with a beginning, middle, and end, right? That's basically what we know as a story. But a story is really a conflict. It's a conflict between two opposing values of equal merit. And it's a fair fight. You can't just have all good guys and, and, and the bad guys and the good guys always win. We wouldn't care. There has to be something redeemable, something interesting about the values that the bad guy represents. So here are some uh, basic conflicts that I just put down, innovation versus tradition. There are actually good things and bad things on both sides of this conflict. And mind versus body, I mean, we've all been on a date, I think, probably in this room and thought, this is a bad idea. And, and yet your body just goes through with it, you know. Um, <laughs> You know, the past and versus the future, I think one of the reasons one of the, that the Pope is currently such an interesting story in the news is because he represents a kind of like, is the past going to win with all of this tradition or is, is the future going to win with a kind of innovation? And it's where he, they represent something that we're all feeling. So they carry that conflict into the marketplace and into the public sphere for us to be able to see, oh my God, which one's going to win? And we don't know. Um, freedom versus convention. Uh, yeah, well, that's a lot about what politics is about. And adventure versus convention. Uh, I think that's the wrong word, but anyway. Um, so, you know, for instance, in the story of Trevor, it wasn't enough for me to just have a conflict between gay and straight. Um, because first of all, it's not like I was saying being gay is better than being a straight person. I just, that wasn't my argument. My argument, was that I really believe that being your authentic self was the best way to go. But there are arguments to be made about being the person that 
other people want you to be, or, or upholding the status quo. There are things that are, you get perks for that, you know, for actually going along with how things are by upholding the traditional. There are real pleasures to that. So basically what I wanted to do was to set up a conflict between is it better to be your authentic self or is it better to sort of be the person that other people would like you to be or the person you used to be. These are all on one side. And then set those two trains in motion and have them collide. So basically as advertisers, as marketers, what you're trying to do is to find a story that can literally move people really move them in their hearts and get them to move from innovation to tradition or from tradition to innovation. But you have to believe in this conflict. It has to be something that's actually universal that everyone in the room goes, yep, that's me. I know that, I know that conflict. I'm dealing with that over here in my life. It's in, it, you have to be able to find the universal conflict, and then find the specific story that's going to act as a kind of uh, satellite that's going to go out into the world containing that conflict. Um, so uh, I think that uh, what we, I, I, I want to just start by, uh, or I think I'm halfway through. Um, <laughs> I want to just bring it a little bit more into your sphere. Um, a couple of, um, about a year ago, I sat down, I was invited to come into an ad agency and uh, to work with a team of uh, advertisers or you know, an ad exec team who were trying to come up with some innovative ways to be able to sell products and uh, come up with stories. And so I taught them the principles of story making and we tried to apply them to some of the products that they were using or selling. So one, it was an exciting day of two, three days of working with them. But one of the most thrilling products that I got to work on was something by Johnson & Johnson. It was called Clean & Clear. It's a, basically a face wash that is targeted to teenage girls. And they'd already come up with a marketing strategy called uh, Seeing the Real Me. And they had agreed, unbelievably, they had agreed, before I got there, I had nothing to do with it, to feature Jazz Jennings, who is a 14-year-old transgender girl. Um, and she was going to be the first person you know, out the gate with this product. It was a revolutionary idea for them to do, especially when you keep in mind that this was before uh, Caitlyn Jenner and, and Laverne Cox and the trans issue became so big. So it was really revolutionary what they were doing. But they hadn't yet found out how to be able to communicate a story using jazz and clean and clear and have it be something that everybody could sign off on. So we started to try to, I, I approached them and I asked them, what are the qualities or the values that you want this company to represent? And so we went down the list. We came up with a list of um, adjectives or values like real, authentic, fresh, original, trailblazer, one of a kind, exciting, spontaneous. Okay, that's all fabulous on that side, right? It's all like amazing, amazing, amazing. But we wanted to see what was in conflict with that. So we went down and we created another list. Fantasy, copy, tried and true, tradition, team player, one of the girls, comfort, predictable. So you can see like there are some great things to being a trailblazer, but there are some not so great things too. And we hadn't really gotten to that because when you look at this list, this list looks like a place, oh yeah, let this, oh, we love this. This is so great, let's go there. But you know, nobody wants to be over here, so that's not really a fair fight. So the next question came, what are some of the barrier experiences that you have in your life to being real and authentic and fresh and original and a trailblazer. What are some of the things that keep you from doing that? And that's what that gave us the second uh, grouping of lists, which are the not so great things about being a trailblazer. And that's the unknown. Nobody loves the unknown. Well, not everybody, some people love it. Uh, strange, uh, it's in flux, it's always changing. You don't even know what it is. It's, it, it can be very emotional. A da a danger, danger, and chaos. So those are some like not 
they've got great things, okay, about being your authentic self. And as any adolescent can tell you, this list is probably where they live. Um, so then we tried to figure out, well, what were the things in conflict? And, and by conflict, I don't mean the opposite. I actually mean in conflict, the fight. You actually want to turn up the volume on creating a fight, but it has to be a fair fight. So unknown, certainty, strange, familiar, flux, stable, emotional, rational, danger, safety, chaos, control. So now this, look, this list looks like some place that you might want to live. And this looks like, I don't know, I'm not so crazy about that. Like, that's not such a great place for me to be living in the world. But then when you put the whole list together, you can see that the things on the X list and the things on the Y list, now it's a fair fight. And now we're going to set these two trains running on the same track heading towards one another, and one of them has got to win. One of them has to, there has to be a climax when they crash, and one of them has got to be stronger. And that's your premise. Your premise is how to prove, using only visual and emotional tools, how do you prove that what you are proposing is right, that the value that you really want to put forward is the one that's going to win. Because you know, storytelling is really about getting the author to be able to perceive, is getting the audience to perceive the author's point of view without saying a word, by just giving them the clues. And like was, has been said earlier, you, uh, sometimes in 140 characters or less. So um, I'm just going to show you quickly the clip uh, that was created as a result of all this work, and, um, and then we'll come back. I've always known exactly who I am. I was a girl trapped in a boy's body. Growing up has been quite a struggle being transgender, especially in middle school. Some kids greet each other with hugs and then just give me a hi. And sometimes I've even been called an it. So I basically kept myself. But this year, I decided to make a change and put myself out there and make new friends. For the first time, I invited girls over to the house. We started hanging out more, and it was just a great time for me, and it still is. The real me is happy and proud to be who I am. And I'm just having fun being one of the girls. I'm Jazz. See the real me. So, so as a result of that, Jazz became uh, the spokesperson for Clean and Clear. She now has her own uh, reality TV show with her family called I Am Jazz, and they're filming the second season for TLC now. And uh, she's going to be honored as the youngest recipient of the Youth Courage Award from the Trevor Project this December at our, um, our gala. So happy ending for her. And um, you know, I think that one of the things that th this shows is that really um, a story has the power to actually move people. And as this is from Bob Dickman, who wrote The Art of Persuasion, if you can't feel it, you won't remember it. And stories have the ability to actually move people, to make them feel something, and what they feel are our shared connection as human beings. Stories are the way that we communicate our enduring values as human beings. And the, the reason that this, uh, the reason that I'm here is to talk just at the end of this as I close, to just say where fearlessness and courage really come in. Because when you're sitting around a table coming up with these stories, it is not enough to just troll the internet and look for a handy hook or a, a, you know, a, a killer sound bite that's going to do the trick. What you need is to look to yourself. Because every conflict is within you. It is in your life. And this is what takes fearlessness. It's not the ability to work long hours, though I'm sure you're fearless in that way, too. But where storytelling is concerned, it really means looking to your own life, which does not mean that all the stories that you will tell will be autobiographical. 
Um, but you have to be invested in the conflict that you are proposing. And it has to look familiar to every single person in the room. And that really takes a lot of courage. My wish for you in closing is that you all are lucky enough to be able to tell a story that will move millions and really in maybe even change the world. So thank you so much for having me, and it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you, James. Thank you. So we have about, uh, about four minutes separating, uh, separating, uh, separating you from the lasagna that's out there. Um, that, that, that was awesome. That was awesome. James is going to hang out for a bit, so if you want to talk to him and, and, uh, and uh, pick his brain a bit, he'll be here. You know, just while we're on the topic of, of doing good, um, something that we've done since the first C3 is um, we've uh, just mentioned briefly our foundation. So when we started the company, we also started a foundation which uh, really with the purpose of doing what we do for commercial companies for uh, mission-based organizations. And every year we go through a, a whole process to select uh, a few mission-based organizations uh, to receive a grant of our entire product, our services, um, uh, many hours of people, uh, people's time from Conductor. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, it's just a privilege for us to do that. So I wanna, I'm really excited just to announce this year that the two winners of our 2015-2016 uh, grant are the March Dimes and the National uh, September 11th Memorial and Museum. So um, if you guys from uh, March and Dimes and the 9-11 Museum are here, just stand up for a moment. Awesome, thank you guys. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you. You are uh, doing God's work. So, um, so uh, we're about to finish, and um, you know, thank you guys for, for all being here, and, and, and we're gonna have a pretty amazing two days. Um, I want, I want to ask everyone here just to do, to do one thing, um, which is think about you know, what the next step of your journey is, right? Of your, you know, think about the next thing that you need to do to push your team forward, to, to do the things that we're talking about today. Just think about that. Um, be, be really specific. Um, I want you to, to write it down, email it to yourself, text it to yourself, but make sure you write it down and make sure that you are specific and just do this right now. Um, and, then, and then I want you to ask yourself, what do you need to do this? Like what, what is stopping you from achieving um, uh, what that, that milestone for you, that next step? What, what is it? Is it, is, it a, is, it a, a, is it a tool that you don't have? Is it a strategy you don't have? Is it some advice? Is it coaching? Is it references? Is it an example? But write that down because you know, here's the thing. Everything that you need is here at C3. It is, this is why we created this thing. Everything that you need is here. There are the people. There are, there's, there, there, there's, there's no one that has the answers that's not in this room. And you have to spend the next two, two days seeking it out um, and, uh, and, and, just, and make, that your, make that your mission. Um, and if for any reason you have, your, you have what you need to do and you cannot find it, you, know, you, can, e you, can, uh, you can email me. You know, you, I'm not going to make you figure out how to spell the Smirtnik. Um, uh, it's N-I-K. Um, but uh, email me and, e and talk to your, uh, to your contact at Conductor uh, on Friday or next week, and we will get you what you need because that is what we do. That is our commitment to you. And uh, most importantly, be fearless and kick some ass. Thank you, guys. Yeah.